Hey, thank you for taking the time to click on today's video. I know that you're clicking on the video based upon what you saw in the title. And today we're going to be taking a little bit of time as a fiduciary to help you be better prepared for taking care of your parents. Now, we're all children, right? We all have parents. Some of our parents are older, some of our parents are younger. But I've tried to break this down into three categories that I think are going to be most useful to you if you're a child that's having to care for your parents and more importantly, having to take care of their finances. The first thing that I would ask you to really take into consideration and to actually apply, to actually exercise, is empathy. So many times I've seen in my 25 years of being a fiduciary where children barge in and they're like a bunch of bulls in a china shop and they all of a sudden just take over everything in mom and dad's financial world. It can be very disruptive. It can be very alarming to the parent. It can be very stressful. And we need to be empathetic that they're in a different stage of life than you are. You're 55, they're 75. You're in the accumulation stage of your life and they're in the distribution stage of their life where they can feel more vulnerable and they've made decisions financially for themselves that made sense at the moment that they made them, but to you, they may not have any sensibility whatsoever. So I just, didn't ask, I just ask you, I encourage you to use a great deal of empathy as you're starting to work with your parents from a financial perspective. Be understanding. Second of all is I ask you to reserve judgment. Now I say this kind of selfishly as a fiduciary and a financial advisor when children come into the scene financially and they want to be helpful, they have every good intention. Because you may not completely understand their dynamics, you don't understand maybe everything that they have their money invested in or how that thing works, I ask you to do yourself a favor and to do the financial advisor a favor if they have one and to do your parents a favor in reserving judgment about what they actually have invested their money in. Again, it can look really foolhardy for you looking at what they've done and you could say, well, that doesn't make any sense. You need to have your money over here, over there. But in reality, it may make perfect sense, but it's not until you get all of the facts that you can actually make a good judgment call as to whether or not them still continuing to keep money in those various different instruments and tools and investments actually is in their best interest. Now, when it comes to a child starting to intervene in a parent's financial life, one of the things that you are going to want to get immediately on your side is going to be family. Making certain that if you have other siblings that you're involving those siblings is going to be a good idea. Now I realize that every family's got different dynamics and you know one of the things that I happen to see is I see two dynamics. I either see where the family and the children get along extremely well and everyone is communicating with everyone or I see the opposite of that where one child is taking over and all the rest of the family may be thinking oh my goodness he's out to get mom, he's out to get dad and everyone goes on the defensive and the dukes come up. So I encourage you, first and foremost, try to get some advocates. You may find that it's one of those situations where the rest of the family is like, hey, dude, do you want to take that over? Feel free. Don't forget not to call me. They may be saying those things, but they're appreciative of the fact that you're wanting to take the initiative to help mom and dad. They're here to, to support you emotionally and you know have things bounced off from you but it is very very important to make certain that they're on your side. Now from a financial transaction perspective remember that you can't do things on a handshake and your good word anymore. What's going to be required is a financial power of attorney. A financial power of attorney puts you into a position as your parents fiduciary where now you have some authority to be able to do things. You're having the authority of being able to write checks. Maybe you have the authority of being able to make financial transactions. And you know what? There's three different kinds of powers of attorney. The first kind is what is called NE. You know what that stands for? Non-existent. In other words, there isn't one. Mom and dad never got a power of attorney. You don't have a power of attorney. And it's something that affords you absolutely no authority. If you don't have one, you're not going to be able to get very far in helping mom and dad. So when we do have a financial power of attorney in place, there's either a springing power of attorney or an immediate. Now here's the Cliff Notes version. 
A springing power of attorney typically requires the parent to be interviewed or to be assessed by two different physicians. This is basically where the physicians can look at your mom or your dad and they can say, yep, they're no longer capable of making sound financial decisions and I advocate that they have a power of attorney. So you have to go through a few steps in order to get that justification before it becomes active. The more, I would say, uh, attractive power of attorney, the one that is more suitable in more situations is the immediate. And you don't have to take your parent to two different physicians and have two different doctor visits in order to get this done. It's just immediate. It's there when you need it. So mom has a heart attack. She's rushed to the hospital immediately. That power of attorney is available for you to be able to act on their behalf. You don't want to forget the CPA or the accountant. Many of the things that we have money in retirement wise are going to have different tax implications. And having a CPA, having an accountant there for you to be able to bounce ideas off from, ask questions and figure out, well, if we went ahead and we took money from this account, is it going to negatively affect mom or dad? Are they going to have tax implications? Are they going to come into a situation where potentially if we sell this asset, they're going to end up experiencing IRMA and they end up losing a lot of their Social Security because their Medicare premiums went up. These are the situations in which that professional can really be of help for you to avoid those speed traps, as it were, that your parents may get into if you make certain financial decisions. Thirdly, you want to talk about the current advisor. Get a feel from your parents if they have the ability of discussing it, the likes and the dislikes of that financial advisor. And then I'm going to ask you again to be very open-minded. Go have a conversation with that advisor and determine whether that advisor is doing a good job for your parents by asking questions, but most importantly, by being non-threatening about it. You see, when a child comes into a financial advisor's office, and you can tell immediately that they got their dukes up, they're ready to fight, they're gonna ask questions, and, and you as the advisor are feeling threatened by this person just barraging you with questions. You're gonna end up being like every other human would be, and you're gonna be clamming up. Yeah, you'll give information, but you, it's not gonna be a good flow of information. So I encourage you, when you go in to interview their advisor, if they have one, be nice. Ask questions. Don't be accusatory. You're here to get information. You can reserve judgment later. You can make a judgment about that advisor later. Now, we have to remember that there's various different types of advisors. There's insurance agents. They may only have an insurance agent and only able to sell insurance products. Life insurance, health insurance, annuities, things of that nature. It doesn't make them less of an advisor, just makes them somewhat limited in their license. You may have a financial advisor who is a fiduciary, someone like myself who's held to a higher standard where we have to provide advice and do for our client what is in our client's, interest, uh, client's best interest. Now, bear in mind that just because you have the licensure doesn't necessarily mean that you're always doing what's in the best interest of the client. And this is where you come into play to be potentially surveying the land, the land and figuring out if this advisor truly is working in the best interest of your parents or if they're just after a commission check. Also remember that falling under the advisory, the, the current advisor model, could be a broker. And these are individuals that work from commission, uh, work for commission, that's not a bad thing always but they're generally gonna be working in stocks and mutual funds and things of that nature. And as a result, they're not able to give advice. They can only be a market maker and sell certain investment products to your parents. But here's an important thing. I'm willing to bet that if a doctor approached you and said that you had a major thing with your health and you needed to have a major uh, exploratory surgery, you would probably seek the second opinion of another doctor to verify and to make certain that that was truly the case. We do it with our health, and it's always important to make certain you're doing it with your parents. All the time I have clients of my own and have parents and they have to get involved in mom and dad's financial stuff, and they will bring what mom and dad have to me to simply get a second opinion. So this is an important component to make certain that you're being able to have the resource available. If you don't quite understand what mom and dad have, having your own personal advisor take a look at this 
potentially will be a good idea, or any fiduciary really for that matter. Now, there is one other component, and this one is the most unsavory, but yet it is so very vital. And that is making certain that you understand what's going to happen at death. How does this product work? How does it work? How does this investment account work? What does this actual investment do when mom or dad die? You want to get a foreknowledge of that so that you're prepared because death may occur and you don't want to be scrambling, you want to be mentally prepared. Number two, you want to understand who gets it. And this is a big one because chances are with most of the financial investments that exist in the accounts today, we have these things called beneficiaries. We have a primary beneficiary, which is likely your other parent. So if dad dies, it goes to mom. But we want to go a step further and we want to look at contingent beneficiaries. This is where we're trying to figure out if both mom and dad die, where does it go? And we want to make certain that that's up to date. Yeah, they picked, you know, Billy, Billy Joe uh, 38 and a half years ago, but maybe he's no longer in the scene. Maybe a daughter changed her name because she got married. There's any number of different dynamics and all across the board, whether it's a bank account, a CD, an annuity, a life insurance policy, a brokerage account, you want to make certain that you're checking out who the beneficiaries are because by the time that the person has died, it's too late. You can't go back and amend those things, so you might as well check into them now as the power of attorney. And then last but not least, how does it get taxed? We have to pay attention to taxes because unfortunately, most of the money that we have saved and worked hard to save for retirement is pre-tax money. And we want to understand that the rules are gonna be different if that money goes from dad to mom versus when it goes from dad to mom to now you and your siblings. We want to understand the ramifications. If we sell this instrument now, are they going to get taxed? If we hold on to this instrument and they die, is there going to be a step up in basis? How many years are we going to be able to take this money and spread the tax ramifications for myself as that contingent beneficiary of that child out? Do I have five years? Do I have my lifetime? Do I have somewhere in between? These are all various questions to ask so that, again, you not only be financially prepared, but be mentally prepared for it as well. So I hope this video has been helpful to you. I know that it is touching on a lot of different areas, but as a child, if you really truly want to do the very best for your parents, not one of these things is unimportant. They're all important. And I encourage you, make certain that again, you're exercising empathy and realizing that your parents are in a much different stage of life than you potentially are. And as a result, they've made decisions that seem to make sense at the time, and you're just here to help them see if it continues to make sense. If you like these little videos, I always appreciate the thumbs up. Share this with your friends. I'm sure your friends have parents too. And if you like our little videos, hit that subscribe button and the little bell, and we'll notify you each and every week that we put out a video. I'm Matthew Johnson. Thank you so much for watching. And remember, it's up to you to make today a great day.